much. And I really hope uh, after my 20-minute presentation, um, you have a much better feel for what has gone on in this research area of biological control of zebra and quagga muscles. Um, I assume you're looking at my second slide now. Um, this is an outline of the presentation. I'm going to talk about Zequinox, um, this commercially available biopesticide now that my lab uh, developed and licensed to a commercial developer in California. And I did that work when I was at the New York State Museum. And I'll talk about Zequinox. Um, I think it's good to have a historical perspective on its development. Uh, these kinds of, um, if you can go all the way from a, a hypothesis that you can develop a biopesticide to commercialization, you're talking about decades of work. So I, I, I want to leave you with that thought, a very realistic thought, how long this stuff takes. So that's the historical development I'll take you through. And then talk about how it's currently being used uh, because it's commercially available. And then at the very end, as you see on the bottom of the slide there, I'm going to talk about my current research interests, which are the development of a new type of biocontrol agent. So let's start with Zequinox and its historical development. Um, why am I showing a photograph of a McDonald's? Well, it all started in that very McDonald's at the intersection of 29 and Route 30 and the Gloversville, Johnstown area many years ago, 25 years ago. I was having breakfast with Jim Cahoon, uh, who's now retired. He was with DEC. We were waiting for a meeting to start later that morning. And Jim says to me, with a cup of coffee in hand, he says, Dan, did you ever think of working on zebra muscle? Now, my PhD is in entomology, bugs. Uh, I said, what's a zebra muscle? He says, well, Dan, they just came in go back one, they just came into New York State last year through the Erie Canal, and they're causing major havoc with the, uh, the power industry in New York, and um, there's a concern that we um, come up with methods to control these muscles so the power plants can continue to function. And uh, for anyone on the call who doesn't know what a zebra muscle looks like, the reason that there are problems and by the way, I'm moving my cursor back and forth. You cannot see that, right? You cannot see that? I don't think so. Okay. So I'll just talk. You see, there are three photos here, and you can see uh, threads coming out of the bottom of those three zebra mussels. And quagga mussels, their cousins that also came to North America, uh, have the same type of threads called bissel threads. And this is why they're so different from any other North American freshwater bivalve because they use those threads to attach onto things. This is what Jim is explaining to me in that McDonald's many years ago. And he told me, look, Dan, they can attach onto anything. It's not just a question of the power industry being besieged by them. There are going to be ecological effects. There are going to be rec recreational effects, etc. Now, why is he telling me this? It's because he knew I had worked with DEC for over a decade on developing a biological control agent for black flies. What you're seeing there is a black fly larva attached to a blade of grass underwater. So Jim knew that I had participated in this international project, which actually came up with a safe, effective way to control black flies that live in water. So he said to me, he said, Dan, would you ever think of trying to find a different biocontrol agent. And you're looking in the lower right-hand corner at the rear end of the zebra muscle there with stripes on the shell and two siphons coming out. You can see hopefully the bottom siphon with all the tentacles there is called the inhalant siphon. He said, Dan, okay, you're an entomologist, but this is a freshwater organism. It filter feeds like your black fly larvae maybe you can find a biocontrol agent that uh, would work against these muscles. So that was the first I had heard of a zebra mussel. And I want to take you a little bit to, through how a bacterium called BTI actually works against black fly larvae so you can see where I went 
in terms of trying to find a biocontrol agent for zebra and quagga mussels. So in that right-hand top image, you see steps one through six as the bacterium BTI is producing a spore. Now you see a yellow arrow. To the right uh, inside that cell is the spore. To the left, where the end of, end of the arrow, is a protein crystal. So when a vegetative cell begins uh, to sporulate of BTI, it produces a spore, and it also produces protein crystals. And then this wall breaks down. They're liberated into the water. So this is why BTI in the Adirondack is uh, working for the last 25 years. Those, the uh, crystal is liberated into the water when people apply it. The black fly larvae have these cephalic fans. They catch a particle. So here's my point. This is a filter feeder. It's a pest. Now, it's not an aquatic invasive species, but it's a pest. And Jim knew that I, in collaboration with other scientists, had come up with this method. And this is how it's used in the Adirondacks. People measure out carefully the BTI. They, they know the flow of the water. They apply it. It's a program that has been successful now for 20 years in the Adirondacks. But when he, he, this was just starting when Jim and I were having that cup of coffee. So, Jim said to me, would you think of pursuing this? And I, I said back to him, Jim, finding such a control agent for zebra muscle would be the equivalent of a needle in a haystack project. And he said to me, but Dan, the power industries have their back up against the wall. They may fund you. And that is exactly how it happened. So a historical perspective, it was DEC that encouraged me to start that project way back. So Jim was right. The power industry, it went by the acronym CIRCO, funded my lab. And in the next year, the funding started in 1991. And look at why I called it a needle in a haystack, because I had to find, my lab team had to find, a bacterium that would do two things. It would kill dry scented, because that's zebra and quagga mussels, where they ingest the bacteria, and very, very important. I'm an environmentalist. It has to be safe for other aquatic organisms. So I often use this analogy of looking for this was like looking for a needle in a haystack, but it worked. After four years of looking for different types of bacteria, we found a bacterium in soil, which, I want to repeat this, bila serendipitously, when fed to zebra mussels and quagga mussels, when grown up, as you can see on the left-hand corner in a petri plate, for example, they died. It was very, very difficult to find it. I had major support from a CIRCO to continue looking for it. In those four years, that was not a pretty picture of looking at over 700 strains and not finding anything. So I want to thank uh, the power industry for getting this thing started. They deserve the credit. And here you're looking at the bacteria. The species is Pseudomonas fluorescens. Those little cells that you're seeing at the top are roughly one micron by two and a half. And this strain that we found in a North American river, and by the way, a river that there were no zebra mussels in, this is serendipitous, okay, that we found a bacterium that has natural products, natural biochemicals inside its cells, which by luck, I'll repeat it again, serendipitously, happen to be toxic to zebra mussels and quagga mussels. So this particular strain, we looked at 10 strains of this species. This is really the only one that we found to be um, effective as a control agent. Now, there's a lot of information on this slide. I'm going to go through it very quickly. This, this is a video now that is being recorded by Troy, and uh, apparently you can go on the web and you can watch the video and you can stop and read these things more carefully. But here, look, I'm taking you through a long period. If you look at the top of the screen, 1996 through 2009, we were funded by other funds started to flow in from federal, state, and private sources. And what did they do? Here are the bullets. They demonstrated its extraordinary environmental safety to other organisms. Again, I'm an environmentalist. That was key to developing a, a biopesticide. 
the next one down. Obviously, we demonstrated its effectiveness in killing zebra and quagga mussels in power plants. Again, why did we do this? To give the power industry another tool, hopefully a safer tool uh, from an environmental perspective, from the typical chlorination that power plants employ. So next bullet down. It took a long time, this bullet, to find the biotic and abiotic factors that affect efficacy in killing the muscles. What's important? If you're going to treat a power plant, should you, is the temperature of the water important? Is the size of the muscle important? Is the pH of the water important? Those are like biotic and abiotic factors, so it took a long time to define them. And once you define them, then you can optimize your treatment to get the greatest kill. Go down to the next one. This was a real obstacle, defining a protocol to mass produce the bacteria by fermentation. Just because you can grow up some cells in a Petri dish does not mean by any means that it would ever go to commercialization. You have to grow it. You have to scale it up, let's say, to at least 100 liters in a fermentation unit to show that it's got legs and could go all the way to commercialization. And then the last one, defining the mode of action. A lot of people say, well, wait a minute. This bacterium is not a parasite of, of zebra and quagga mussel. It's actually an intoxicating cell. Again, natural uh, biochemicals are present inside it, which serendipitously kill them. Well, mode of action. If you look at the right-hand side, the B photo here, these are the normal, we call them digestive tubules. Anywhere where you see white, like inside a circle there, the center is white, that's where the food passes in the zebra mussel. And then the nutrients are absorbed out into the uh, lining, into the cell surrounding that circle. Okay? That's normal. Over on the left-hand side is what happens when zebra and quagga mussels, this, this is the same organ over here on A. It, they lice when the uh, cells enter the digestive tubules. Again, it's part of the digestive system. They lice those epithelial cells. It takes several days for the muscles to die, but that is the mode of action. And one of the clearest pieces of data that we have, that is, that is the mode of action. It's actually intoxication and not infection, is that we showed that you can kill all these pseudomonas fluorescent cells and then feed them to zebra and quagga mussels, and you get exactly the same kill. So this product, Zequinox, guess what it has inside it? All the cells, all the bacterial cells are dead. You do not need, need them to be alive. Excuse me. And, you know, when I first learned that, Many years ago, I said, how is this? No, this is good, I said. This is very, very good because I'm an environmentalist. And now you're putting out essentially dead bacteria, which lowers any potential environmental risk. Um, so 2010 comes along, again, 20 years. When I say it takes decades to come up with biopesticides, all the way from a hypothesis in a McDonald's in the Gloversville area, okay, to actual licensing something to a company and the company saying it's from bioinnovation. You know, this is not the kind of thing you want to hold your breath waiting for. It takes decades and it takes lots of money. In this case, about 4 to $5 million in grants that came to the New York State Museum for this, thing, for this project. Um, when I say the environmental safety of Pseudomonas fluorescence the active ingredient, again, of Zequinox is extraordinary. Uh, you can study this slide at your leisure, but it truly is. It is now the safest, in terms of environmental impact, it is the safest uh, control agent for zebra mussels to be used, whether it's inside a power plant or um, I'll talk a little bit later about late, okay? So um, it doesn't mean that it, there is no, don't, don't misinterpret what I'm saying here. There, all control agents have impacts. All. I don't care what it is. There's, but hopefully they're negligible. So if you, if you apply Zequinox to the label uh, requirements, you should not have an environmental impact of Zequinox. 
Okay, so that's the his, the history going from the um, McDonald's all the way to commercialization. What's happening now with the Equinox? It is starting to be used in power plants. Again, that was my dream, right? It's starting to replace broad spectrum chemicals that power plants use. And also, the one on the bottom is a, a real surprise to me. I'm delighted in a way, but it's a surprise. People in lake associations are now asking, can we use it to control zebra mussels in lakes? Okay? And that's what experiments are ongoing right now. Here's one from Illinois. Now, you can see there's a yellow rectangle floating out there. And that's what they're starting to use. They're starting small in, very, in, in, in control studies where they may have three or four of those floating curtains. They treat them, as you see the gentleman is, is doing there. And notice also in the upper photo that it's white because these are, you're putting in at least 100 parts per million, 100 uh, milligrams per liter of dead bacteria. And also the, there are other items in the formulation of Equinox, which I believe must be white because the water is actually a little whiter than I, than I uh, found when I treated uh, with um, just the cells. So it's, um, you'll see white in the next photograph too. And in the slide in this study, they just published this uh, in the last few months, uh, they were able to get 90% kill of mussels that they had placed inside the floating curtain. And I was involved in a treatment. You can see another type of curtain there. It wasn't floating. That curtain went all the way down to the bottom, five, six feet, of a boat ramp in Minnesota. Uh, Zequinox was used to control zebra mussels at that boat ramp in September of last year. And you're probably all familiar with the environmental impact of, uh, on unionids of zebra mussels. And the uh, USGS has taken a real interest in trying to examine the equinox for its potential to clean off endangered and threatened species of unionid clams that are infested with zebra mussels. So there's a lot of interest. Here's a take-home message. It's not my last slide, but it's a take-home message. And that is, is Zequinox the final answer, the complete solution to the zebra quagga mussel AIS problem? Is it the silver bullet we are all waiting for? And I've got a line at the bottom. Unfortunately, not, okay? It is not the silver bullet. Now, a lot of text here on this slide, but again, you're welcome to go back when the video is posted. I want to go through these sentences with you. Yes. Small high value areas within lakes, like you got a beach that is uh, fouled with zebra mussels, sure, you, 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 you could possibly use it. Boat ramps, as was done in um, Minnesota. Uh, like I said, the USGS is very interested to uh, protect unionids that are threatened or endangered. Now, go down to the next line. But these isolated control efforts will have little effect on the following. Remember, in, imagine a lake, there's a beach in one little spot, it represents one thousandth of the surface area of the lake, or a unionic restoration bed that's you know, half an acre over here in the corner. Zequinox, I predict, will be used in those circumstances. But you're talking about such a limited area in a lake. And there's two reasons, and I'll continue to read after I give you these two reasons. One, like all pesticides, and Zequinox is a bio-pesticide, they cost money. So you have, it could be cost prohibitive to treat too much of an area in a lake with Zequinox. The other aspect is the thought of trying to treat an entire lake with anything is probably not only cost prohibitive, but technologically difficult, if not impossible, to get the control agent in every nook and cranny in an entire lake. So they may treat in limited high value areas in lakes, but that will not stop the continual spread of dry centers from lake to lake. That's my first dash, dash there. So in terms of slowing the spread, 
it's really not going to have a major impact until we can treat entire lakes and drastically reduce uh, zebra mussel populations, quagga mussel populations in the entire lake. And I, off the, you know, the back of an envelope, I think you would have to reduce the zebra quagga, uh, quagga mussel populations in a lake by 99.99 before you'd ever really start to stop the spread out of that lake by people, you know, hit, with the muscles hitchhiking on boats, et cetera. There's also a thing at the very bottom of that slide. I said it's cost prohibitive to treat an entire lake. So I want to read that sentence. In addition, no matter how drysenin specific a control agent is, and don't we all want it to be very specific, Organizations such as lake associations will rarely have the financial resources needed to treat an entire water body even once, much, much less annually. So people can say, oh, there's going to be great things coming down the tube for controlling zebra and quagga mussel. Ask them how much it's going to cost and see how much it really could be used lake-wide. My next slide. Let's look at this in perspective. Their native range is Eastern Europe, let's say, and they went into Western Europe. They've been in Western Europe a couple of hundred years. Nobody has come up with a way to control them effectively lake water. So if you want to control dry centers in entire lakes, and you want, to, you want to do research to come up with a new biocontrol agent or some other method, that would be a needle in a haystack project. And I often use that expression because it, for some reason I'm attracted also to these needle in the haystack projects that people say it's unsolvable, uh, you can't do it. So I pose this question. What kind of zebra mussel or quagga mussel control agent is needed for lake-wide control? What type of needle, so to speak, in the haystack should we be looking for? Remember I talked about cost and the difficulty of getting a control agent into every nook and cranny? In, in a lake if you're going to have lake-wide control. I believe that the next control agent, or the first, should we say, that would ever be used lake-wide, though, would have to be something you put in the water. You may call this magic dust. I don't. You put it in the water, and it's going to be self-perpetuating. It's going to spread from that one bay that you put it in into the rest of the lake. Now, I'm, I am a specialist in biocontrol, but I believe that's exactly the only option. That it has to be a live organism that is placed in a lake, it self-perpetuates, it can reproduce, and it self-spreads, not only within that lake, but from lake to lake. And of course, the bottom, because I'm an environmentalist there, it must be extremely selective. selective. This parasite, which is where I'm headed for infecting um, uh, zebra and quagga mussels. And I want to mention that my initial focus in this project that I'm starting is a lethal parasite, Haplosporidium rabii. And why am I interested in that? Well, first of all, my research team helped find this thing and describe it. Right now, it's only known from Europe. And what it does, if you look in the left-hand side, there, those are the gills of a zebra mussel. Anywhere where you see white, that would be water passing, and anywhere you see fingers, so to speak, jutting out, those are the gill filaments. Notice how they're all filled with little spores with red dots in them, hundreds of spores. What that is, is that is this spore-forming parasite, which is my primary focus in starting this project off, that has consumed, that, this parasite has consumed all the connective tissue in the gill and elsewhere in the muscle, so it's a lethal parasite. Now, when I start this project, as I started it, I look at the haystack and I say, I gotta find a needle in there. In this, pro in this project, it's a parasite. So I take a close look. Sometimes I get a little too enthusiastic, but get out the magnifying glass. You gotta find the needle in the haystack. Well, I hope you realize that if you are going to try to find a needle in, in a haystack, you need a little more novel method than a magnifying glass. So take that analogy and I'm going to move forward. I'm going to show you a trick 
that can be used. So you're not stuck with a magnifying glass trying to find this parasite in the haystack. Okay. You need a novel twist to find a parasite that could be used lake wide. You need a you need a shortcut for the, to find this dream parasite. And there are powerful techniques to finding a needle in a haystack. So if you look at the bottom line, if I said to you, that guy there in the yellow shirt, Dan Malloy, he can find a needle in that haystack in 20 minutes. Would you believe me? Again, I think I could find a needle in that haystack in 20 minutes because there are novel techniques that can be used such as, not a magnifying glass, you, you know, you buy a Texas-sized magnet, and with 20, within 20 minutes, you have a shot at finding that needle. And that is the analogy I'm going to show you. I have another novel technique. I'm not looking for a metal needle. I'm looking for a parasite. So here is the novel twist. There is a shortcut to finding this dream parasite. Inside that box, it says, introduce a novel parasitic species or strain to infect naive zebra and quagga mussels. Now, there's a bit to digest there. And I want to digress just a little bit. I have a few minutes left to talk about the concept of the naive host. And I'm going to take you to the marine environment. You don't even have to read the text at the top. In the photo, you see the eastern oyster. You go into a restaurant, you order oysters, that's the eastern oyster. Well, back in the 50s, the thriving industry of the eastern oyster was decimated. In fact, it was 19, 19 in the 50s, it was 1956, all of a sudden, 95% of the eastern oysters were lost in the Chesapeake Bay and the Delaware Bay. And it was from a parasite. They didn't know what this parasite was. I'll show you a picture of it there with some spores and uh, some uh, vegetative stage plasmodia. They could see the parasite. Now, 50 years later, we know what that disease was, that parasite was, that destroyed the eastern oyster population. That parasite that caused that disease was actually, and is still causing it. The industry has never recovered. That parasite was a species that normally infects a related oyster, the Pacific oyster in Asia. The eastern oyster was a naive host. You know, you folks work on invasive species. The parasite that came in in the 50s and decimated the eastern oyster population was, in a sense, an invasive species. Of course, no one brought it there intentionally, okay? So think that bivalve can be naive to think. So this is the novel twist. This is the magnet I'm going to use to more quickly find a parasite. I am going to look in areas, ancient areas, where there are parasites of Drysenis in Eastern Europe primarily. I've already started. I've worked in Macedonia. And look in those areas, so it would be to the right here, in the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea areas, the real ancient areas. And I am going to find a parasite. And when I expose North American zebra mussels to that parasite, they will be naive to it. And they will be, it will be highly virulent to them. So this has happened already by accident with the eastern oyster, for example. Now, this will take decades. Let's say it takes a decade. Half of the time, we'll be trying to find that needle in haystack parasite. And the other half, because I'm an environmentalist, will be proving that it's so host-specific, we can introduce it to North America. And that's at least another five years of work. And then I came across this uh, presentation by uh, Dave Adams, and I hope he's on the call today, back in 2011. What Dave did for me was outline how biocontrol agents are allowed into New York State and North America, and there are federal and state guidelines for that. So this is the project. I hope I have uh, properly uh, 
kind of explained how I'm going to uh, accelerate the process of finding this parasite. And there's two things I want to leave you with. They both begin with a P, two words. One is persistence. Research teams, like I'm forming, need to be incredibly persistent because it takes so long to find solutions. And the other P is you folks. You have to be extremely patient because it takes so long to find it, and then it takes a long time to show that it's clearly environmentally safe. So will there ever be lake-wide biocontrol of, of dry sentence? Don't give up on the potential use of parasites for that pr purpose, but it will take a decade at a minimum. I, I have included this slide. It's everything that I've talked about to kind of show you the historical development of Zequinox. No need to read it now. You can refer back to it if you wish. And then the second thing I've done in summary is I've tried to show you I'm going to start looking at this species which consumes all the connective tissue of zebra mussels and make sure it's um, environmentally safe. And then uh, may not use this exact species, but I'll go find another spore former which is very, very close to this one which zebra mussels haven't seen for millions of years. And that is the approach. Thank you very much for your time. I hope I haven't.